If you have lost your sense of taste or smell recently, listen up. CNN health reporter Jacqueline Howard has details on how those specific symptoms may be the only symptoms that some patients ever have after contracting coronavirus. Jacqueline? Brianna, it's having a recent loss of taste or smell that's key. We already know that can be a COVID-19 symptom, but this new study details how about four out of five people with a recent loss of smell and or taste may test positive for COVID-19 antibodies, which means they probably had the illness. Here's what this study found. The researchers looked at 567 people in London with a recent loss of smell and or taste. Among those people, about 78% had COVID-19 antibodies. Among those with antibodies, about 40% had no history of cough or fever. The study also found loss of smell was more prevalent than loss of taste. People with loss of smell were three times more likely to have antibodies than those with just loss of taste. One, two, three. If and when a vaccine is made available, may not be up to the president alone, or even the FDA for that matter because there is a small secretive group that sees the vaccine data before anyone else. This all gets decided by a group called a Data and Safety Monitoring Board. The DSMB, as it is known, is a group of experts in all sorts of areas, like statistics, ethics, vaccine development. They are the only ones to get a few, quote, unblinded looks at the data as it starts to come in. They know who got the vaccine, who got the placebo. They're the ones who figure out whether it's time to say this is working. That's not a political decision. They are the ones that can advise the companies to apply for FDA review. Or they might bring a trial to a halt. And right now, they have one of the most monumental tasks in the world. We want to know they're fully independent, that they have no prior uh, you know, relationships with the company, so they're not, they're not conflicted in any way. The members of the board do go through a fairly exhaustive vetting process, but these are perhaps the biggest questions. Can the DSMB be trusted? Do they have financial or political conflicts? Can they be pressured? What they don't want is um, their members of their committee being besieged by outside people trying to find out what's going on in the trials. Typically, their names remain confidential while the study is ongoing. But Susan Ellenberg who serves on COVID-19 DSMBs, agreed to talk to us. How would you characterize the power of, of this board? I don't think you feel powerful. You feel responsible. You know that everybody's trusting you with these data. When you're looking at data, I think there's always a perception, certainly among lay people, that it's totally objective. Is it really that objective? Of course, there's some degree of subjectivity. It's a judgment call. And, and that's the way these committees work. I don't see any reason why it should be delayed further. The FDA basically said that it's very reasonable to wait and observe for two months before authorizing anything. The president has said, you know, they may not approve those guidelines. So what happens then? What's the role of the DSMB in a situation like this? We've certainly never been in a situation where the national leadership has seemed to be so involved, directly involved, in these kinds of processes. What will happen, I, I, don't, I don't know. It was a DSMB that made the call to pause the AstraZeneca trial when a previously healthy 37-year-old woman developed a neurological condition in the UK, and it was a critical decision. Even an adverse event that happens as infrequently as one in uh, 10,000 people or one in 20,000 people, that would be a lot of people who would have a serious adverse event. The country's top doctors assure they won't be cutting any corners on safety. But for now, it's in the hands of Ellenberg and other members of the DSMBs to make sure that's the case. I think we're in uncharted territory here. This is, who, who knows what, what, the, what the administration is going to do. From the moment when you start to show first symptoms, you display symptoms of coronavirus, how long at this point do we believe you are contagious?
You know, uh, John, it really varies from person to person. What usually happens is that you get exposed. After a couple of days, the virus replicates in your upper airway, and you can be infective to other people for a day or two before you actually get your symptoms. Once your symptoms come, that's a median of about five days is the median time from exposure to the expression of symptoms. And then after a few days, you might be sick, and yet the virus is no longer transmissible because we've done studies when you try and isolate the virus from the nasopharynx, when people even are in the disease state or recovering, and you don't have it. So it's usually before they get symptomatic and for a few days thereafter. The general guidelines are, when is it safe for a person to go out from the time they get symptoms? It's probably around 10 days from the onset of symptoms, you usually have no virus. And in the studies that have been done, those people generally are not at all infective to other people. HHS Secretary Alex Azar and the doctor that the president seems to be listening to most of late, uh, the radiologist, Dr. Scott Atlas, they met with several scientists this week who are advocates of herd immunity. I know your team has looked into the whole idea of herd immunity and, and what that might actually look like in this country if we chose that path. What did you find? Well, we've got to um, be really clear what we mean by herd immunity, because there's two ways people use the term. One is, you know, how many people have to be infected or vaccinated before we you know, stop transmission. And the other one is as a strategy. Uh, and as a strategy, it simply means doing nothing and letting the virus run through the population. But that's that's a recipe for just uh, a, a, an awful lot of deaths in the country. Can you just explain it says 40 percent herd immunity, if that's 40 percent of the population had had COVID, we would have 815,000 deaths, basically double. If it was 60 percent, it would be more than it would be a million two hundred thousand plus. Yeah, and we, we can make these calculations because we know pretty well from the surveys about antibodies, we know pretty well what the death rate is by age. And so we can take that death rate by age, how many people would have to be infected before you get to herd immunity, and, and make those calculations. So it, it's pretty disturbing because even the most optimistic view, let's say, you know, as you said, 40%, it suggests we're, we're not very far along in, in the epidemic yet in the United States. You know, it's interesting, Dr. Murray, because uh, uh, Alex Azar, he, he was sort of referring to this meeting where the, the, the plan or the strategy was that you insulate the vulnerable people, right, which is about 40 percent of the population based on age and pre-existing conditions. Insulate them, but, but go ahead and let schools open for example, making the case that young people uh, could essentially become a herd, I guess, of protection around the more vulnerable. That's, you're hearing that a lot, and I think that's what uh, Secretary Azar was referring to. Is that, is that have the same problems that you're describing? Well, you know, in a, in a theoretical world where everybody who's vulnerable, you know, everybody over age 65, people with comorbidities, don't come into contact with everybody else, Maybe that would be possible, but that's not what we see in any country. What happens is when there's a lot of transmission, like we saw in Florida, in younger people in early July, it eventually gets into the people at home, the parents, you know, older friends, and that's when we start to see the deaths tick up. Mm -hmm.